Blake Mullen, formerly a successful goalkeeper and currently an assistant coach at the University of Scranton. Blake achieved a laundry list of accolades through his playing career, earning All-American status at his alma mater, St. Joe's, Maine, where he also broke the all-time NCAA record for the most consecutive shutout minutes. 1,706 minutes, nine seconds to be exact. At the next level, he continued to be known for his shutouts, winning the USL2 Golden Glove Award for best keeper in the league with the Western Mass Pioneers. Post-playing career, he passes his knowledge along through coaching, gaining experience at the University of Virginia, University of Vermont, Post University, and now the University of Scranton. I know him as the guy who rainbows players 1v1 at tryouts. podcast spotlight episode we one are. we're joined by an extra extra special guest mr blake mullen uh, as connor so beautifully uh g- gave us a little intro on blake welcome man thanks for being here welcome welcome, welcome. hi guys thank you for having me uh, always my pleasure to come on here and talk to you guys yeah, for yeah, sure. I think the last time we had Blake on, it was uh, he was working. He was working. But he, he was on duty. He, so gave, he, he gave some of his time to us. Uh, we were treated at Second Bridge Brewing Company where he was working, and we had did a live watch there. So I was not yeah, there. That was, that that was fun. That time, let me tell you, that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. A, that was a wild time. That was fun. He hooked us up. I, I think in, know, what game was that? It was. A, it, I know it was a zero zero game. It was because, Liverpool United. Yeah, at the end oh. we talked about how every single live watch we always do has no goals and it's kind of like a stagnant sort of back and forth matchup. But yeah. that's why we dropped to the other teams because they actually like <laughs> <laughs> the bad team score actually still. So yeah, but yeah, I mean, we, uh, we're lucky to have you here and uh, good good to get it kicked off. Yeah, love it. For sure. uh, beers first and foremost. That's a staple of our podcast. Um, if you want to run through Blake, if you want to go first. All right, mine's in, Pulling out. A, I got to put it in a cup, but I am drinking at the moment. Let me find it. Got to throw it in my backpack so no one sees. Keep it nice and <laughs> cool in your warm backpack. <laughs> I can't and do it. It's cool. just uh, Broken Heels Hazy IPA from Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania. Right okay. on. Wow. A little local out in PA. Yeah. yeah. I, figured, I figured you guys all do the local IPAs, so yeah. That's I figured what I'd do one. I kind of figured you'd right have on one from Second Bridge, and I'm sure uh, the owner will have a word with you about that in terms of uh, in terms of getting the name out there. But that looks pretty good too. Yeah. Is there a lot of beer out there in PA. I don't even know what it's like where you're at. Um, not around me, to be honest with you. There's not like a lot of breweries. I would say. I mean, I haven't explored much because I've just been coaching. I coach the NPSL team here as well. I'm on I'm not on staff there, so I haven't had much time to explore. But Based on everything I tried, that screen is very, very small, and it's uh, there's not a lot to do. So I'm gonna guess probably not a big beer scene, but a big bar scene at least. Uh, yeah, well, college town. That, right? That's good. <laughs> as long as you can get the alcohol somewhere, you're you're doing all right. But I think exactly. I think we're all drink. Oh no, Jay, introduce your staple. I'm drinking it truly. <laughs> I'm drinking it truly, guys. I know that's uh pretty uncommon for me. Drink yeah, seltzer, shocked. but uh, back to your roots. Yeah, you know it's summer. You know, good. Something hey, refreshing. Keep it clean. That it was the good. sound of my socks getting blown off by that <laughs> informative nugget you just dropped. Just uh, Is it good? Delightful. <laughs> if, you had to, if you have to pick, which one are you going with? Blueberry, acai, or wildberry? Oh, blueberry all the way. You hear that? You hear that truly? Yeah. Dumb no, question, it's, Connor. It's it's raspberry man, lines fucking disgusting. Point. Whatever. I don't want to ever drink that. <laughs> this man a shipment of truly. Thank um, Connor, thankfully, uh, your parents had stopped in, Maine, stopped in Maine at Baxter Brewing Company. Tristan and I are both drinking Free Jack's IPA. Pretty good. What did you think, Andrew? I liked it. Yeah, yeah I like very, it too. It's, very, it's light for an IPA, honestly, and tasty as well. So. Shout out Baxter. Shout yeah. out Baxter. I'm drinking uh, another Baxter beer, oh. Howl, Toge- Howl Together. It's a pil- Pilsner. Fits right on. Uh, Fitting. <laughs> right on cue with what I've been drinking all summer. Nice and light. Uh, and... My parents went here. They got my dog a collar because his name's Baxter. So uh, just a little backstory there to the beer. But uh, yeah, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to get into things with Blake. Um, and we're excited to do so. Um, we've been looking forward to this for quite some time to get some soccer opinions, well-established players in the game, and now obviously coaching. So 
Uh, let's get this thing rolling. Um, Blake, we're going to bounce a couple questions off you and talk as much as you want, talk as little as you want, but we're going to probably put you on the spot a couple times and keep it light. So try to not talk little though. Imagine if you, every answer he was like, yeah, it was crazy. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you. You got to run it by my agent first. That's yeah. 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 Everything has to we be. do that before. Um, but we'll open things up with something that I did reference on that brief introduction, which is probably one of your biggest achievements. Um, I know you've had an awesome playing career and I've somewhat idolized the success that you found in the game, but this NCAA record, most consecutive clean sheets. I don't know that it's something that will ever be broken, but 17 well it was the entire season regular season through the playoffs and then i think the ncaa tournament is where you finally conceded so we just want to kind of get a look into your mindset through the duration of that season and then also talk to us a little bit about the goal that broke it and does it haunt you does it not but yeah what was going on that season what allowed you to find success um and what were your thoughts through it were you pressured feeling anything specific or just going with the flow so that was that that was a crazy season so um yeah it's one of i thought i thought we were going to go with the rainbow i thought that was going to be what you were going to say is the most spectacular <laughs> uh, thing about my career i mean I, <laughs> that, that was, was a good one yeah. something i'll never forget when you did that that was, uh, I was like, but uh yeah it was a crazy season to say the least um we just had a we had a great back line and our our team like we were just very very good defensively that year uh we were kind of always very talented in our front four um our forward broke the record for career goals at at this at st joe's so it was always we could always score but keeping the ball in the back and that was for 1700 minutes was uh very hard i'd say because in the gnac as we all know it's not the best conference in the country for d3 soccer Right. But it's like uh, you got to, as a goalie, you have to be, you have to stay in for all those 90 minutes just to make that one save in the 90th minute. And, you know, they, we play the 80, 89 minutes. I don't see a shot. And then the 90th minute comes around. And I got to stop one from inside the six. So I always just had to be focused at that point. Uh, 1700 minutes was uh, not easy. I mean, we played a decently tough out of conference schedule. I think we had like Odin and Kobe College that year. So it was it was definitely fun. Um the goal that they scored on me is the first round of NCA, and I still remember it very, very vividly to say at least. Um it was against Mitchell College. We were at Tufts. Um Tufts was watching a Tufts all the whole team was there watching on the sidelines. Um it was a shot from the right side of the 18, it goes through my center back's legs. I see it late and it goes into the bottom corner. And at this point, I'm relieved to be blatantly honest. <laughs> I'm very relieved that this whole thing's over. You know, it kind of takes the stress off us that, you know, we did so well. I mean, it was better than what anyone would ever, would ever expect, but it took a lot of stress off. I think our back line mostly, I was like really never stressed out about it because as a goalie, you're going to get scored on eventually. You're not going to go 30 games if you make it to the national title without getting scored on. That'd be incredible. But eventually you're going to get scored on. So I was like, all right, I'm relieved. Let's get, you know, let's settle back in. But then right after that, we went to full panic mode. We're up 2-1, full panic mode. Um, we probably about five minutes later, Mitchell comes back down the field they cross it and no one's on my back post and i dive goes in again they score two on me but the second one's ruled off sides so oh. it was uh <laughs> it was kind of crazy we kind of it was just full panic at that point i mean it was like the players were like what do we do now that we got scored on? Actually, we've been scored on and i think it was 21 games or something like that which is kind of crazy um but I yeah, think, you know, like was, one of the things, Blake, I want to uh, to compare it. It's like if a pitcher has a no hitter through seven innings, and some jackass wanders into the <laughs> dugout and is like, "Oh, hey, did you notice that you haven't given up a hit yet?" Like, <laughs> how much during the season was the no goal streak a part of the game? Like, because you mentioned yeah, it, it was a massive uh, relief when the when the ball went in, but that that to me says that before the ball goes in, it was like something that was constantly on your mind. So obviously, it it has to do with you. But was your whole team sort of like? Did you find it was taking? 
um, it was, was it almost a distraction, would you say, in, in a way? But um, I wouldn't say it's a, it was a distraction as much because I think that I think we all knew eventually it was going to happen. We were going to play a team that was probably much better than us. We were just a small school in Maine with a bunch of guys that kind of got lucky that we were all put together on one team. And uh, really good goalie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, we had, I mean, our, back, our our center back was all American and our six is one of the best that we ever, I mean, he, you, you would never notice that he did anything special for the team, but he always just stood back there, defended, got stuck in, was always yelling at me, you know, just to stay in my box, never do anything crazy. Um, so we had a bunch of good players. Um, it wasn't really until I have to say probably like halfway through the season that people just started mentioning like, yo, you guys got something special going on here. Mm-hmm. And like, <laughs> how long can we, how long can we do this for? And I, I, it's not, it wasn't like Adrian was my coach at the time. It, it's not like he ever mentioned it. it was more of like the assistant coaches. They're like, like a shot would come in on me. I'd make a good save. They're like, I thought you lost it there. I thought it was all over at <laughs> this point. I'm like, guys, come on. We're having doubts now. And uh. So I don't think it was very stressful on the players. So, um, to add to that, so a lot of a lot of athletes in general are superstitious about things. I know you're saying that it, you weren't feeling the pressure, you weren't really focusing too much on it. But was there anything that you did before a match, thinking about it, like just on your own, like in your own space and in privacy, that you were like, if I do this, they won't score, or like, it, it, was there anything like that with you leading up to a game? Um, so not like during that season, I just do, I mean, for every season I do the same thing. I mean, I go out there, I'm thinking I'm the best, thinking I'm not going to let up a goal, kind of, you know, that you have to have that mentality as a goalie. You got to kind of have be crazy a little bit and think that you're the best in the world. Um, so that was kind of my mentality just all throughout my college career that, you know what, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to do, the, I'm going to stop as many shots that I see and, uh, we're going to go from there. As long as you guys can score, I'm going to hold it down the back line. Even if I see you guys give up one or two shots, I'm still going to put us, hold us in this game. I'm not going to let up a silly goal just because I'm only seeing one or two shots in the 80th minute or later. So, I mean, yeah, the superstition wasn't really a thing for me, but my head coach was very superstitious that season. Um, wore the same shirt, same pants, same shoes, never washed them. So... <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. That's so, that's so stinky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. stinky. Especially it was, when you it was like, season. yeah, it was like the grossest thing in the world. <laughs> like, dude, like, come on, like you can't be that superstitious about this. It's gonna, it's gonna come back and you get us one day. So you at go least, from, at least look clean, right? Yeah. You go from the summer all the way through the fall and oh to, into gosh. like the early, late fall, where it's pretty cold up in Maine, and then like, oh, God. and I mean, by that time, there's no getting well, out of the yeah. clothes. I'm thinking yeah. too, like you know, I would say I don't wash my pants all that. Like jeans, you don't wash that much. Like if you have a nice pair, you don't. But a, t- a shirt can collect some stench pretty quickly. Like <laughs> oh, yeah. like one game when Especially you're stressed. Especially like athletic material. Like that. There's some trash. musk yeah. going on, yeah. and I don't know how the campus food is, but that's gonna relate to how you <laughs> smell too. So I just and I went to LaSalle where they, sometimes the campus was a bit dodgy. So <laughs> that would that would create some musk. But I mean, whatever works. Clearly, it was working to some it degree. Did, so it did yeah. work. No. And I the, mean, you, it was it was like it wasn't even an athletic shirt. It was like a button down. So like it was kind of oh. blister, but it, it was it would you would see the sweat in it at, like throughout the game, especially oh. like in August, like or early September. It wouldn't be cold in me. It. It'd be hot on the turf, so he'd be sweating. And I was just like, dude. Like, see, I don't think he even washed it after we got scored on, to be honest with you, because we were at Tufts at that point. Well, I started so like no I'm, surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't catch a whiff on the way by in the handshake line, because we played you pretty late in the season, I think. That yeah. Year. And I was like, didn't notice it, so he must have been having a lot of yeah. Axe body spray. Or you or probably something. smelled that bad too, and yeah, it was just that, like in your definitely face. A fact yeah, that, um, yeah, you're probably thinking it was one of your players or one of our players at that point. You're like, he can't yeah. be the head coach. I felt this bad. He was just coaching the entire time. <laughs> no, for real. Um, but yeah, what an achievement. Um, and do you do you think? I mean, I don't know if you want to speak on the record itself, but do you think it'll ever be broken? And when was the previous record? I don't know if you know that off the top of head. From. Um, will it ever be broken? I don't think it'll be broken in my lifetime, to be honest with you. I think it, it's possible to be broken for sure, but I don't think in my lifetime it'll be broken again. I think the last one to do it was a UCLA goalkeeper in 08, I think it was. Right. So I think that was the last year to do it, which I mean, 
and then there was like a bunch of 90s and early 2000s was like the last one so you got 11 i years. mean okay, yeah bro, i can't That's imagine it. <laughs> it, yeah. won't, it will probably won't happen. And way back then they were using like pigskin balls and in 08 <laughs> yeah they, i don't even know what was going on. they were playing on yeah. concrete in back 08, then right? in yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah they, i mean they had they didn't even have the round post where the ball goes in they had the square post so it was always oh, coming out the square. Man, the so it, it should have been easier it should have been easier put off the post you know it's not yeah. coming in right yeah. yep yeah, I think that's one thing that record holders can cling to is like the game is going to continue to get and evolve. So it's going to be harder and harder to like have those just unreal records like Will Chamberlain's 100 point game. Like those are things that just probably will never see happening again. We'll see close, but maybe not the record itself. So props to you on that. Um, and then moving into that, our next question. Um, so being that you've played at all sorts of different levels, um, we just are curious to learn more about the different levels of play, how close they are to one another. So you and I, back in the day, we obviously played club, but as you kind of moved up through the ranks, um, you obviously played at a USL2 club, you played at the collegiate level, and you got to experience high D3 levels of play, playing against Huffs, opponents like that, some of the, I think, national championships, that national championships that year. Uh, I might be wrong, but um, what are the gaps and like is there a extreme differences that you notice between the levels of play throughout your career um is there certain ones that you favored over others and yeah um so definitely you could see it from the d3 level to um kind of like all i think all levels of d3 are kind of the same like everyone wants to play the same way you know if it's, if it's a tough style they're going to possess we're going to possess you know um if not then you're going long i mean there's it's there's not much time to go over anything in a d3 season especially because it's such a short preseason you don't have much time in the spring so you know it's all going to be built the easiest way possible the easiest way to learn um when you get to the usl2 level it's kind of different you get i mean it's it's definitely quicker i mean you get the you get the d1 kids you get some 30 year olds that are still playing that played pro at one time so everything's a little quicker um so it's usually just one two touch you know kind of very possession oriented i mean when i was on western mass we would just play on the back go up the field we had a lot of south american kids that were very technical very skilled so you would see that the finishing at that level is a different breed of soccer for me, especially as a goalkeeper. Um, those kids could, I mean, ping a ball side to side, and the next thing you know, I'm on one side of the goal, I have to go to the other, and they can shoot from 30 yards out, but rockets on me. So it's like just that, that was like the biggest difference for me. It's the game, the pace of the game was definitely quicker. Um, but I, I mean, I think majority, if I mean, if you play good style of soccer in D3, I think that it wouldn't be that big of a jump for you. Then when I was with the Harvard Athletic for a little bit, spent three months there. And that's, I think, where the biggest jump comes, comes in when you get those players that are paid to play soccer. I think that's where the biggest jump comes in when those guys are fighting for their livelihood and, you know, putting, putting their whole heart on the pitch. Everything's 10 times quicker than USL2. Um, and you just got i mean they're just a bunch of big boys that live soccer that live for soccer i mean they're they're building muscle they're they're fast they're pacey i mean that's just a different brand of soccer so blake would you say that there's a certain player you have in mind because a name drop is always fun for podcast sake but is there like a certain player you remember playing against or a team rather where you're thinking man like this is this is the highest level i've ever played against for sure um so I'll go college. I'll do. I'll do it through the ranks here. I'll, I'll go college first. It's going to be Tufts. Tufts or Amherst. I mean, Tufts played a very good style of soccer. Um, it was very interesting the way they played. They had an all-American midfielder that I think ended up either going D1 or D1 offer. So he was very good, very technical. Um, Amherst. They just played, you know, bully ball. I'd say the least. Uh, they didn't want to play us on turf. They played us on grass. And it rained the day before. They didn't. They knew they didn't stand a chance on turf. So, right. um, but they were that dude just builds big, big guys out of his back. That you know when they're gonna live off that set piece. So that's like those were the two college ones I would say. And then when USL two, it had to be last year we played in 
and national semis, we played North Carolina Fusion. And those, I mean, that's like, those kids were very good. They're all like ACC players pretty much where I was just yeah. like, dude, I'm a D3 soccer player. Like, this is crazy <laughs> to me. Like, like I'm playing against these guys and they're quick. They're painting the ball. Um, they're just, they have everything sorted out. Like, you know, their communications at a whole different level. Their, their goalkeeper played at a high level. So I think that those are like the two, two people that, two teams that would stand out and then, at the at the USL championship level, I mean, the players uh, they had what's his name? He's still there on um, Hartford. His name's Danny. He plays wing there. He was he's the captain now. He was there. Very good guy. Welcomed me. I mean, I was just you know I was just a scrawny little kid still in college at or right out of college at that point. He welcomed me with open arms, but he was quick. He can move. He can move the ball very good technically. Skill moves ran up the side and was very passionate about the game. I mean, no matter what, he would, I mean, he he was just like, he was special to see. I mean, he was just one of the best players. And of course, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll jump around here a little bit, but coaching wise, Danny Pereira, he was the number one, number one overall draft pick two years ago. And I got, I was at Virginia Tech at the time when he was there in the midfield. And for, he was a small guy but he might have been the best player I've ever seen play soccer in person. He was very technical, um, could hit a ball wherever he wanted, free kicks, you know, he had, he had everything. He was a small guy, but he had that grit to him where he would body the base guy off the ball and no one could touch him because his feet were so quick. So that's what I would say for, I mean, coaching wise so far. Uh, that's crazy that you get to experience that. Who did he get drafted by? Is it? Austin FC. Is he playing at all yep. FC right now? Yeah. yeah, he is. He's playing right now. He uh, he did score a banger like two weeks ago, I'm pretty sure. He far down to like 30 yards out. That is very MLS. Yeah, it's the only MLS yeah. goal that anyone scores is a banger yeah. from 30 <laughs> yards out. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of those now. I, I was going to ask, so at that, you get to the paid level, right? Um, granted, it's, I mean, they have to work to make a living. Do you find that when you get to that paid level that there's individuals in the game that don't have a passion for it and are just that talented or at the USL championship level and then you see these top class guys that are probably going to likely move to pro levels? Are some of them just that talented where they're like, this is what I was like kind of born to do, but might not be as passionate about it? Yeah, you can def you definitely see it at that level. I mean, you, def you can see it at any level. I mean, just the pure talent of some D3 players or D1 players where they're just so talented, but they're, I wouldn't say lazy. They're just not passionate about the game as much. I mean, they're there. They're just not there mentally completely where they can just have the ball at their foot, put it wherever they want. They're not going to think. They're just like, all right, I'm going to do this for 90 minutes, get off the field, go do something else. And you can definitely tell at the USL level that people, some people are very passionate, you know, they were very blessed for the opportunity that was given to them. And then there were some dudes that were just, you know, talented. They're like, all right, I'm going to show up to practice, do my thing for an hour and a half, go home, go to, go to the game, go home. It's like, I always think about what, what after the game instead of the game itself. So, <laughs> yeah. That's crazy because you can see that, like you said, that happens a lot. Who is it? Luke Shaw, right? Yeah. Luke Shaw. <laughs> At any level, like you mentioned, like I feel like playing in club or playing in college, like you you had those players that would just be like, what, what are we doing tonight? What are we doing later? Like, like you Which said. Which does make sense because yeah. you, you don't yeah. go to the USL to play to make millions of dollars. I yeah, feel like the yeah. passion is probably pretty high in the USL. Maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of those guys probably do feel lucky to still be playing a high level of competitive soccer. And they feel, while they are skilled enough to be there, they feel lucky that there's a league fit for them that they can play. Right. And so, yeah. but in, like, like you mentioned, in Premier League and in all the, the major four leagues, I'm sure there's plenty of guys who don't really give a shit. They like making lots of money. They know they're good. But, you know, I, I would feel that passion probably rivals at, at a lot of the levels you've played because again a lot of those guys probably still feel pretty uh, fortunate to be there yeah i mean that's that's definitely for sure they're definitely fortunate i just at the usl championship level it's just like so some of those dudes are drafted you know they, they get drafted right out of college and then they're loaned to the team where they're like all right i'm playing as i'm just gonna use me i'm playing against a d3 soccer player like what the I'm, so i'm not gonna swear i'm not gonna swear but like yeah. uh what the heck is this guy doing here and uh <laughs> Um, 
I've played at, you know, Providence or Georgetown, or Virginia, Virginia Tech, and it's like, uh, it's like they just don't want to, they think they're better than what they are and they don't want to get anything out of it, I would say. That's the biggest thing. They're just like, all right, I shouldn't be here and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hopefully get out of here, but I'm just not going to put my full self into it, so. Kind of a, it's kind of an interesting scenario because you feel like psychologically people would be like, I got put here, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Not, I'm here, I won't give my all but I want to get out of here. Like, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like a funny way of thinking. Yeah. About it's, definitely, it's definitely frustrating, especially yeah. with Blake being a coach. Like you see it and you're just like, dude, if you just focused for yeah. like five minutes, like you don't understand how good you could be. And it's just right. like when you see it at the yeah. level, like, right. and they're taking their chances, it's like when that chance goes and they're just like, what the fuck? Like I didn't get selected or what? Yeah. You're like, dude, like you didn't do what you needed to do. Yeah. They're, yeah. Li- they're living in like the small world of being the best where they are currently, but they like either are afraid to tap into and realize the stakes and that, okay, you're playing at this level. Now you could get to this level, but it might intimidate them or whichever, but it's like, you're, you're playing at a high level. Now you're the best at what you are. Like, and now, you're just not like, dude, you're still a small, fi- small fish in a big pond. Like, yeah. You could be so much better. You could climb the ranks, but not putting the effort in. It just doesn't take you there a lot of the time. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's just like the biggest thing I've seen in coaching. Like some people have that natural born talent where they don't need to train much or anything like that, but there's other kids that will work every day of the week and they'll just never be as good as this person. And the one person that has a natural talent, just if he had, even half that one person work ethic, they, you know, yeah. next level, yeah. like MLS, you know. So. Yeah, damn shame. That's, yeah, <laughs> you hate to see it, but on to the next question. Who wants to take the next one? I'll, is it, is it, uh, yeah. Yeah, run All through right. it. So my question is, uh, being that you're, you've experienced like all levels of play, do you think there is a natural per- like progression or like steps, like if you were to write a book, is there steps that you could take to go from where you're at USL two to go to USL to then go next step and then MLS? Like, do you think it is possible for you being a standout D three athlete for you to eventually get to the MLS? Do you think it's even from a playing standpoint or a coaching standpoint, have you, do you think it's achievable for someone with a dream to get to that level? Um, yeah, so playing wise, it's definitely harder for D three players. I mean, that's I think that's a given. Uh, in America, you're just looked at as more of a academic side of school, where you're there to play soccer, but you're going, you're really there for the academics. You know, soccer always comes second. Um, so it's definitely a little harder. You're overlooked a lot at that level because you, you know, they don't think you face the competition that you do, but. As you said, you have the toss who have D1 kids, Amherst has D1 kids that just didn't want to go there. So it's definitely harder to do that as a D3 player. And the, I mean, the progression would just be for, for anyone that wants to do it. It's go out there, you know, in the season, do everything you can. Off season, you know, spring, stay out there, you know, get, get the boys out there, shoot some balls, you know, play some small side stuff. Um, in the summer, I would say the biggest thing, like NPSL, USL too. I mean, you're playing against, you know, some of the best college athletes in your area. Um, so that will progress you to the next level. I think once you get at that big stage, like coaches start to look like, all right, this kid can play at this. I mean, he's playing against some of the best. So I think that's the natural progression to it where you're just grinding all year round. Like, I didn't have one summer off for four years in, in college, which I didn't mind at all because it probably kept me out of trouble to say the least. So, <laughs> I mean, it was good for me. And, and uh, so I think that's just a natural progression, just the grind of it uh, from the D3 side. Coaching wise, I mean, I'm still young to the coaching game. So, I mean, the progression is definitely I think tougher to get in there. Um, you just, I think it's more connection based to be honest with you. Like yeah. you have good connections um, and you do it well for a coach that knows someone in the MLS or know someone in the USL uh, championship. Um, it's 10 times easier, I think, to get a job at that, that type of level than, you know, it's, it's definitely possible to work your way up like a side coach. I mean, another well-known program, he, he did it all by himself. He, brought Messiah up, went to the Riverhounds, and then I think he's 
at Bucknell now. So like he's gone to he's gone through it all. He's done it himself. I mean his connections are probably incredible, but he's the connection you want. That's the thing. So yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it seems like the progression is it, it you just have to work hard, basically. Work hard. Yeah. Be a player, work your ass off and then as a coach, like any job in probably any career in any industry, it's who do you know? And who right. knows you? Yeah. How well do they know you? Are you a good worker? Are you smart at what you do? Have you impressed them? And then from there. And in your head, the like, obviously, United States gets loads of crap on just like the football hierarchy and the tiers. Like, does it make sense? Like, is it a natural progression? Like, does it make sense compared to leagues across? Is it getting there as far as like what the steps are? Or are we still a very long ways off? I feel like in Europe, it's just more, you know, there's not as many colleges. So that's the biggest thing. So like Academy, you're working with the best players at that point, at that progression, you're, you're, you're looking, you're like Mason Mount came up from an Academy. Like someone's coaching him at that point, you're coaching some of the best players in the world at that point. So I think that progression is a little different than the U S say the least. I think it's just more Academy based and, and you work your way up through that. I mean, that's the way I would say in Europe is over the U S where you kind of, you have to jump around, you know, to kind of find your fit. Find you have to spend a couple of years, you know, even if you majority of the coaches in college soccer have a staff that they're going to leave with or come with. So it's like, if you can join, if you can get into that, it's kind of like Europe, I, I would say like everyone has their top, you know, assistant, but it's hard to get into that staff, you know, and build that connection. So and I guess in your own career, did you ever look to play at an academy level or at a level where a lot of these MLS clubs, they have like their academy teams. Like you see a lot of people they've played in like the U12s of like the revolution or, or uh, New York Red Bulls. Did you ever look to do that? Or was it mostly like stick to club ball, go to college and figure out from there? Um, yeah, I never played that. I never uh, even thought about it. Like the craziest thing is that I, was, I played travel soccer for like yeah. a lot of my career and then a guy I was playing travel soccer was like hey our club's having tryouts I think they're really good you should come and then try it out rainbow the kid and then the coach goes are you actually like do you play goalie I was like I play goalie he's like do you do you play with the gloves on like because I was just known as a travel goalie like he didn't believe that I actually <laughs> gotcha. played, like an actual organized goalie and I was like yes like I know like I know how to play uh goalie at that level so but no, it wasn't, it wasn't much like that for me. It was just, you know, I just go out there, grind, kind of, you get to meet the people. I mean, Connor, Jordan, all, all my East Hampton guys. So, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of fun. I mean, you get to build that camaraderie, camaraderie as people. And then we all get to play against each other, which was awesome as well. Yeah. Okay, Blake, you have to just tell the rainbow story because he brought it up <laughs> in the intro. You mentioned it now, and I don't think I've heard the full detail of the story. So do you want to just take a few minutes and talk about when you rainbowed somebody at tryouts? It sounds pretty badass. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's not that long of a story. So like, I, I just went in there as, a, as like a new guy, you know, someone that I, I don't know. I know one person that invited me to come. The coach is, uh, I mean, I still, he's still one of my favorite coaches of all time, Andrew, right? And then he was, he was a great guy. So we're just playing like, I, with like uh, punk goals, we're just playing small, like little small possession type of to goal. And I had the ball. I, I don't even know what I was thinking. And Blacked out. I had the ball in the mid zone. <laughs> I see him one on one. And I'm just like, all right, let's rainbow this kid at this point. So I rainbow him. And everyone's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What did this kid just pull out in the middle of the tryout? And I was like, yeah. So that, I mean, that is like the, the story I remember. Uh, it, I just don't know what I was thinking, to be honest with you. That, that's what's it. It's just, if there's I, no thought I process behind this rainbow. rainbow. Yeah. They, they saw you rainbow and they were like, immediately they're getting goal. <laughs> was it, was it, was it exactly. clean? They're like, they're clean. Like, that's like clean. the thing about like, it. Like, you, you got I remember the ball. watching and I was just like, okay. Like, and he did it. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, and I was laughing. Like, I thought it was hysterical because luckily I wasn't the one that like it happened to. <laughs> if so I got rainbowed gonna, like that, bro, I would be down else, horrendously. But, what would I do? Uh, I would have to leave the tryout. You got to leave the yeah, tryout. Yeah. Yeah. What, if, what if it's day one? I can't come goalie. back for day two. <laughs> Jay, if the goalie <laughs> rainbows you, like if yeah. if the Danny Barrera rainbows you, understandable. But if the goalie, the keeper comes on and rainbows you, 
You got to uh, go to the car. What am I like, like? What am I? What do I tell my parents? Yeah, pure right. gold. <laughs> Nothing. I'm a hey, failure. Dad, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't happen today. He's like picking new. Hey, mom, hey, dad, you know, don't waste the money. I'm playing you know? football, but the, the one with hands, though. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, not, yeah. I'm not with the football. <laughs> you know, I don't even want to do physical activity at this point. I don't want to do anything to embarrass me. I'm going to just hit the piano, you know, I'm just going to do it myself. Sports entirely. Mom, I need Pro music gamer. classes. I need, yeah. I, I, Mom, yeah. you got to buy me a violin. I'm going to try to get really good at that because soccer <laughs> is clearly not working out. Uh, uh, Blake, I could listen to you talk about player stories all day, I could listen to rainbow stories all day. A large portion of I feel like where you're headed right now is in the coaching career. Uh, and I would just like to know about the transition between playing the coaching. I know that's frustrating for a lot of young coaches to be part of the game in one way and then be part of it in a way different way. I guess what are some of the main challenges you faced right off? What's something that you've not liked about coaching? What's something that you like a lot more than playing if there, is, if there are those things? So I think the biggest challenge for me when I started was and still, it's always in the back of my, my mind is that, you know, you're young, you can still play soccer. So, like, I always want to get out there, you know. I was, I was like, texting my parents probably like a month ago. I'm like, you know, maybe maybe I should keep playing at a high level. And they're like, yeah, but you're kind of ahead of everyone. So, it's like the plus that I'm young, I've had the experience so far, and I'm miles ahead of, I would say, people at my age that, you know, I've been to three D1 schools and uh, University of Scranton on the women's side of it, which I'm coaching is the top 10 in the nation. So it's like something that's something you can't pass up on, at least, especially when I got the Virginia Tech job. Um, it was just kind of wild because I just got a phone call one day. He's like, hey, Virginia Tech's looking for a goalkeeper coach. Are you interested? I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, I, I wasn't really thinking about it. I was with Hartford Athletic at the time. Um, I get a call Friday. Like he interviews me, he goes, "Yeah, we're really in a need for one. We just lost ours. He went to Duke." I'm like, "Yeah, no, no I'm, I'll, you know, send me everything. You know, I'll look it over." Like he's like, "These are your responsibilities, everything like that. Like you have full range of keepers." And I was like this is kind of crazy. Like I was 20, I'm, I think I was 22, 23 at the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Dude, this is crazy." Like I'm going to a D1 school do that and you red shirting you're probably looking at someone your age yeah and they're just like <laughs> I would... well, the, yeah so like when when i was there the goalkeeper that was starter was older than me so wow it was, yeah even like my last well two jobs ago post university d2 school in Connecticut, kids were older than me as well and I'm, i was 24 at the time so there's still the kids older than me at, at this level no matter what coaching just you know the respect thing is definitely hard i would say at the coaching level being as, as young as i am people are like you know what like why am i gonna listen to you over someone that's been doing it for years and and we're so similar in age but like you know i've kind of been around the block shortly but i've been around with some great coaches i mean mike brazil was my first coach at virginia tech he taught me so much i mean he trusted in me to bring a kid randomly up from Connecticut to coach his goalkeepers and we went to the Sweet 16 that year. So it's like, you know, you got to have some faith. I've, I've learned, I mean, Steve Swanson at Virginia, the University of Virginia on the women's side, um, I learned a lot from him. I mean, they do analytics to the top end. I mean, he won two World Cups with the women. So, I mean, it's like Jeez. the coaches that I got to coach with is uh, awesome. The best thing about, I think, coaching is like, you get to see a game from a different perspective. I mean, I'm on the sidelines now, you know, you get you kind of get to see like when I'm, when I was in the back, you know, you get to feel a little bit now on the sideline, you kind of get the control of everything and you get to see the players develop too. I think it's the biggest thing. Like if they want to become pros, like I want to push them to become pros. Like I want them to live the dream that I never technically could. So like, I want to push them to that level and yeah, that's it. That's what I would say. Does it give you any, does it give you any added respect to coaches you've had in the past and maybe what they have to deal with and all the work that goes into game day and setting a team and running tryouts and everything or practice rather like did, did it give you sort of a, a newfound respect to the, the whole process of everything knowing how much goes into it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like, even like D1, D3, those coaches are grinding year in year out. I mean, it's crazy like the D3 level, you don't get the money that the D1s get, but they're traveling up and down their region to on their own, pretty much their own dime, maybe a little bit of school time um, to recruit the best players they can. And then when you get to the D1, these coaches, 
going overseas, leaving their families, you know, for weeks, months at a time to try to find the next best guy. You know, it's, it's, it's like a whole different respect that you got to give them. They, I mean, it's just the biggest grind. Like you're giving up so much of your time and your life to kind of help out kids. Like at the D1 level, you can help out a kid from, you know, Germany that wants to go pro, didn't have a chance in Germany, come over, get an education, you know, and have him go pro because of you at that point. You know, you brought him to the college ranks, you gave him an opportunity to get an education. So I think that's the, that's the biggest thing for me. What's the like biggest thing you've learned about yourself since you've gotten to coaching? I guess at this point. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, biggest thing that I learned about myself, I think it's that. This, yeah, it's definitely a tough one. Um, the <laughs> biggest thing that I think that I've learned is that I didn't know as much of the game that I thought I did. So yeah. I, you yeah. know, like I could, I, I like I knew majority of the game i mean i played soccer my entire life but like tactic wise you know can we step here can we not step here where should we position certain players i think in like formation wise like what is the difference between this formation what stops this formation so i think that's like the more the soccer iq what i would say kind of like all right i thought i knew it all but i really don't at this point is it like a good level just to know that like while you're teaching kids, experience. Yeah, yeah, you're like teaching kids about the game, but you're also learning yourself every day. Like it's you growing as a coach too. So it's definitely like a good start, I guess. Yeah. No, oh, it's definitely that. I mean, I learned from like, I learned from the girls at Virginia. They taught me, I mean, I was there for I think four months, three months in the spring. And I mean, just those girls taught me so much about the game. I mean, I never coached women's soccer before. Like, you know, it's definitely an overlooked sport in America, women's, women's soccer in general. I mean, but those girls, I mean, it's like some of the best girls I've ever seen play soccer. I mean, some of those girls are very talented. I mean, it's like, of course, they're the best of the best. I mean, it was when I got there, girls, I think we had five girls at national team camps throughout all ages. So, it was like, um, That's crazy. it was eye opening. And they, I mean, they just taught me so much too. I mean, they were just like, Hey, can we do this? Like, you know, they always wanted to watch film. They always asked me questions. So I had to learn too, as fast as I could to help them out as well. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Was there, was there any hesitation or fear going in? Obviously there's probably doubt going into coaching, but what was like your biggest fear? I guess, like taking that leap of like, like you said, you didn't know that much. Like you, you realized while coaching, all right, you didn't know as much as you thought you did, but I guess, without even knowing coaching as well as you do now, what was like a fear of yours or a hesitation maybe to taking up a role at the D1 level, like you mentioned? Uh, the biggest fear for me was the respect, easily the respect factor. Like would the people respect me knowing like D3 soccer, like never played technically pro, pro soccer, played semi-pro with USL2 and, you know, I was on trial with a, champion the usl championship team but it was like a respect factor like will these will these men and women respect me even like you know like they'd be like oh you went to a small school in maine like all right like might as well just go get a hobo off the street at this point i mean you know like what is what is this guy know? he went to you know he went to d3 school so i think that was the biggest thing and kind of like the second biggest thing would just be like them wanting to learn from me and take it in with I guess, it, I guess that is respect too, but just like them wanting to learn from me and my mistakes that I made and take it to heart over, you know, just like, all right, you know, this guy, what is he talking about? Like, he's, he's letting dribblers and do D3 soccer, you know, at this point. So I think that's the biggest thing was definitely the respect that I feared. Mm -hmm. no, that's totally fair. Um, I guess moving on, um, uh, Blake, so when it comes to, I guess you're, Looking back on your career, what made you want to be a goalkeeper? Obviously, you have you have the size, you have the you have the size to be a goalkeeper. Was that something that was always kind of were you always designated to get the gloves when you started out as a kid, or was it kind of something you were drawn to? It's a very unique position. It's the most competitive position, being there's only one spot on the pitch for it. So, what was that like for you growing up, and why did you choose a goalkeeper? Um, so I was never like. I didn't, I was never really this tall in life <laughs> up until like high school, I would say. Like I was never really that tall. When and I for, context, for context, you're, you're six, seven, correct? Yeah. 
Yeah. Just, and I'm six yes. seven as well. And I remember leaving junior year of high school for the summer and I was like, I think I was six two, six one, six two. And I came back at six six and everybody was like, What the hell happened to you over the <laughs> summer? Nuts. Like why do you look like that now? What happened to your body? So yeah, I guess doubly like, was it just, Oh man, I, I have the, the space to keep up the goal now. Like I can do this. Is that sort of what it was all about? I mean, yes. So like when I was younger, I was just, I mean, I don't think I've ever loved running to be honest with you. I think that was the biggest <laughs> thing that drew, drew away the field play for me. I, I just didn't, I mean, and then I was just obviously somewhat crazy. So I was like, so remember I had to be like six or seven. I'm just like, Put me in goal. Like even if I even if we weren't playing with goalies, I'd just stand in front of the goal and just handball it. And they'd be like, What are you doing, Blake? I'm just like playing goalie. Like <laughs> you guys like it or lump it, you know, I'm gonna be back here. Yeah. I'm not running around this field. So I think that was the biggest thing. And then kind of like when I hit my growth spurt in high school, I was like, All right, there was there was doubt. Like I went to a private high school and I'm not gonna say anything about the coach, but um there was definitely some hard times where I was like, you know, do I even want to play soccer at this point? As even though I was big, I wasn't that great, I would say, kind of peaked in college. So it's just like, do I even want to play? Do I want to spend all this time, this money to play soccer? So it, it was just like, you know, the, the psychopath thing at a young age, not wanting to run to say the least. Yeah, that's completely fair. And um, it's good to see that because I feel like a lot of the time it's just size that kind of throws you in. It's cool to see someone get drawn to it or like, like you said, you didn't want to run. He, he, just, wanna... he has a passion for yeah. handballs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, That's it. Yeah. So I guess when it comes to the, the position itself, it is a very, it's a leadership based position just because you see the whole area of the pitch, you're directing your back line where you want them to be, how you want, even your midfields, you can basically direct the entire pitch. So you can call it kind of a, co-captain position but you don't see many goalkeepers being captains and that was kind of my my question my next question is um do you think the goalkeeper position should be removed from the captaincy position because they're not technically all around the pitch they're just directing it from behind the reason why i ask is because you see a club like united who in De Gea, he's someone that the club are looking for a captain at this point and they haven't chosen him yet. They're, they're desperate for one. Maguire seems to be uh, plenty of mistakes in him. He's <laughs> sh- shaking, shaking your head here. So he's not getting the captain's armband, but there's an argument to be made that maybe ca- uh, goalkeepers shouldn't have it just because they're not, I guess, moving as much as the rest of the team is, and they're not involved as much, I guess, every second of the, every second of the match. Is that something that makes sense to you? Or do you think that there should be less of that and more goalkeepers wearing the captain's armband? So I can definitely see it from both sides, especially to me being a keeper. I mean, I think we should get the captain's our band. I mean, we're moving everyone around. You know, we're the coach on the field technically at that point. We're moving everyone. We want them in certain spots. We're saving the game. You know, everyone can go for glory, score a goal. But if you don't allow a goal, the glory is all yours at this point. So I can definitely see it from that point. I mean, some of the best players in the world at this point, like Courtois, De Gea, Neuer. I mean, most, some of the, like, craziest guys per se again. I mean, they definitely deserve that, that uh, captain's arms in. But then again, you, I see it from the other side as well. It's like a coach told me one time, I don't remember the coach who it was, but he's just like, you know, you're just, you're just not like, like once of a tackle gets involved at half field, you're not running up and talk to the refs, you know, like that's the biggest thing. And like, you can't chat with the ref, like, you know, get in his ear. If like, say a foul happens down the field, you know, and he calls the captain, they're not going to have a goalie run from his box to talk to the ref at that point. So I just think that that's part of it where they're not fully, they're, they're stuck inside an 18 yard box over, you know, a 120 yard pitch. So I think that's the other side that I see. Was Lurie a captain? Larissa is the Spurs captain. Yeah, he's one of them. So I only know Casillas. That's the only other. Like, yeah. Casillas was one. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure was Buffon one or no? Was uh, Chiellini? Gigi might have been. Maybe for Italy. I don't know. I don't know if it was for anyone Italy in that. Any of that anyone in that Juventus side uh, when they're at their peak could have been captain because yeah. they're just yeah leaders all over. But boy, I think uh, I think it's like Neuer. Neuer might be like the one of the only at this point. Yeah, yeah. where 
And I think Kendanovich for Inter might have worn it for a little bit mm. too, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Good shout. It's, it's always one of those things where it's like, oh, did he actually wear the armband? Or was he just but a that's leader like, in the team? That's sort of, you know I feel I mean? like Blake's whole point. Like, yeah. regardless of whether or not you're chosen to get the armband, whether you like it or not, or whether you want it or not, you have a massive leadership role. Like you said, you're kind of behind everything. You're directing everything. You're setting up defenders. And it goes further than that. You're making sure that the midfielders are pressing, the wingers are where they need to be. So I feel like it's a great point to, regardless of whether or not you have it on your arm, you are expected to be a leader to, to some extent. That's just part of the part of the job. Yeah, yeah I mean, 100%. I mean, Captain Bear or not, you're, you're, you're out there, you have to lead. I mean, it always looks good on TV, you know, on a website where your parents watch to have a captain's arm man, but can you do it without one? I think it's the biggest thing that, it's like a mental block for some people where if you're not getting it, you're like, all right, I'm not a captain. I'm not going to say anything. You know, you're, you feel like you get no respect, but it's like something you just have to block out as a keeper. I mean, you're overlooked technically. Your one mistake leads to a goal. It's all your fault. You make a big save. Someone scores an easy tap in. He wins the game for you guys. It's not you. So it's kind of something that you just have to block out, I think, as a goalkeeper. And did you always – as a person, did you always feel like someone that was kind of that had leadership qualities or was it something you developed over the course of your entire career? I mean, I don't think I, I don't think I've ever had leadership qualities to be blatantly <laughs> honest. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather just sit back, relax and kind of, you know, watch and enjoy and just, you know, let other people lead in front of me. But at a certain point, it's just like, all right, like I have to step up. I mean, the leadership quality is tough. I'm just very, I'm just, I, I'm a homebody. So it's like outside the field, like I don't like to do anything. Like I just like to do my own thing, sit, sit at home, sit on the couch, watch soccer. So it's like on the field, like I have to yell at someone and, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, but it's something I definitely grew into, especially soccer. When, when, especially when I became decently good, it's like, all right, you're going to have to start, you know, doing something with your voice. If not, you, you look like a fool back there at this point. Yeah. Right. yeah, so it's something you got to kind of hone in on and yeah. develop as a goalkeepers as a are asked of that. Like you yeah. have to be a leader from the back. And I mean, that's something that Blake, I think it's your competitiveness that kind of kicks your leadership and that vocalizing from the back into gear because you're obviously and then the more that there is on the line as you gain success and the competition grew like that's kind of, I mean, probably some of what drove you to be that leader tapping into that goalkeeper mindset as well. I feel like it's kind of a general consensus that all goalkeepers have a little bit of a loose screw. <laughs> Is that something you would agree with? I know you said you were kind of the crazy kid that would just stand in front of the goal and put your hands up and block shots, but are goalkeepers getting a bad rap or does that kind of have to be true? Do you have to be a little bit crazy to be a high level goalkeeper? I mean, I, I, I personally think it's true. I think, to be honest with you, I think everyone has, I mean, you're seeing like at the pro level, you're seeing a dude like Ronaldo hit a shot, like what, 50, 60 miles an hour from the PK spot. You have to be a little crazy to you know, <laughs> stand in there and take that. Like dudes don't even want to block shots at defenders sometimes, but you know what? You're just going to take one, you know, point blank to the face and just suck it up. You have to stay in the game because you're, you're the only one on the field. Like, you know, you get two goal, goalkeepers, one on the bench, one on the field at that point. I think there, I think you definitely got to be a little crazy. I know, I mean, it's not meant for everyone. Where you know, anyone can, not anyone, but you know, a, a right back could end up becoming a forward. So I think it's just you know, it's a different mentality that you have, and you have to be a little crazy to do it. Yeah, there's some, probably some adrenaline that just kicks in and takes over, and you black out for a second. And oh my gosh. when you when you get you bum rush the. Uh, the attacker one v one and maybe yeah. get a cleat to the head and just like you said walk it off. Yeah, I, I one, mean one battle ago. Yeah, what the was biggest, like the worst? What was the worst? I guess situation for you if in a goalkeeper position. All right, so I'll show you. So there's two summers ago. I he pulls out all of his teeth. He's like, these are fake teeth. I love those <laughs> so two summers ago, I was just playing like in a men like a a random pickup league like it was, it was like the, i think it was called connecticut pro league or something like that it was i mean it was just like such like a nonsense where these dudes had like full-time jobs and would come out and try to cleat me in the head i'm like dude i have a day job they like, come on let's calm down like i want to go i don't want to be injured so we were playing a game 
and I came out, so I tackled the dude, took two knees to the head. Wow. Oh, man. You can see that. Oh, yeah. see oh wow. Oh, that's oh. dear. Sorry for any views. So I took, <laughs> so you I took like two knees to the head, head. <laughs> and one was from the attacker, one was from the defender, and I remember getting up, and I go, I should be dead. This is, this is, that's the first thing I thought. I'm like, dude, two knees to the head. I'm like, dude, I just got up like it was nothing. Like, I was like, dude, this is crazy. So what was like, I I had so much adrenaline at that point too. It was like, it popped right up. (laughs) So it was popped right up. They, they wrapped my head. I have, I I think I got like 13 stitches in my ear. I played the rest of the game. I think I played like, like 55 minutes with it. And then I just go and I'm just calling everyone like, dude, look at my ear. Like, how about you just go to the hospital and shut up at this point? And get that ear. Protocol. That's so goalkeeper of you. You're just like, you're live streaming yourself bleeding out. <laughs> just like, yeah, this is what happens when you're a goalie. Goalkeeper. Yeah, you. I'm just like, I'm like pulling it apart at this point. I'm like, hey guys, what's up? You know? Oh my oh, gosh. gosh. That's ass. Through some stuff. I'd but, retire. I'm pretty squeamish, so I can't wait to change the subject. Uh, <laughs> if you thought you were getting through this whole podcast without having to answer to the current state of Man United, boy, oh boy, were you wrong. I mean, I, that's what I've been waiting for a lot of the episodes. I'm, I'm a victim too, Black. Yeah, I think you know. I'm, I'm <laughs> you got a fellow United sufferer fan, here, or... so bounce it off each other. We're just right. here to enjoy it on the wings of the table, but... Yeah, what are your... Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess Blake, you can just start off sharing like what you think's going on with the club and your your thoughts on them going forward with Ten Hag and if there's you know real change that's going to come of of this uh managerial switch uh, i mean i love Ten Hag. i've loved him since his ix days i mean the ix team was just talented i mean they don't have you know they come up from the academies they sell them for lots of money so I, I mean the way he ran that team it was very good i mean they'd make it to what the knockout stages of champions league every year so I think we're in good hands with him. Um, uh, I mean, this whole Frankie the Young thing is just irritating it's to me at this point. Brutal, brutal, absolutely brutal. It's it's just ridiculous. Like we're gonna hold up money. For, uh, he's he's. I mean, he's great. I, I I would love to have him, but we're holding up money for him. Like, I mean, I I, I would love Telemans as well. I mean, Telemans yeah. is is class. So I mean, he can make up for the Young. Uh, I don't like any, I mean, I hate Harry Maguire. You might as well let him go for free. I'll take a rock instead of him at this point. Um, <laughs> that's just a given in life, I feel like. Um, I like Victor, Victor and Lindelof is good in my mind. I mean, he's, I think he's, I think he's underrated. I think a lot of people don't like him. I think he's very good defensively. Um, <laughs> Andrew doesn't rate him that high. I, I don't not rate him. I just I have I, there is moments he's where a he, scapegoat at times. Boy. No, he he is a scapegoat. He, he 100% is. Yeah, he's a scapegoat. Yeah. I don't think he's. I think he's a good defender. I think he's a good ball player, good ball playing defender. Um, and he reads the game all. He's just not. He gets bodied very he, easily. He has to face the punishment of playing next to Maguire, and it's partially his fault when he plays. But if well, it's Veron next to Maguire. Then it's like, oh, Veron's playing next to Maguire. That's why he's not. As good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I think. Uh, that that's a good shout in terms of Lindelof. Lindelof does become the scapegoat probably a lot more than he should be. I mean, even like, I think, don't quote me on this, but he's not liked in Sweden by the national team either because he missed, I think, um, a camp because his wife gave birth and he's just hated because because his wife gave birth. And now you're just not going to pick the dude. Like it's crazy. Like it's a personal matter at this point. It's like, Man, you, uh, was it two years ago, last year, when De Gea had a kid, and then we just outed him for Dean Henderson for a very long time because he had to go through the quarantine. Oh, my he had to God, that was insane. To have a kid. So, yeah. I, I think it's crazy. And, I mean, he's definitely a skateboard go or outside backs. So, I mean, you, I mean, I'm going to guess I, I don't like Juan Bissaka. I don't like him at all. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big Luke Shaw guy, to be honest with you. I think Alex Spielman's – better in my mind i think he's skilled with his feet not as well defensively i would say but he gets forward um even though shaw puts in good balls and everything like that um ronaldo let him go let him go i'm okay with it at this point i, I i'm gonna say something crazy as a main new fan never wanted him back i think the biggest thing was that i thought if he came back and didn't perform well he would have ruined his legacy with this with this team 
and now the big deal of him just staying one year and leaving again it's just like you know it's, it's drama at this point it's like something you don't need even though he's a great leader he trashes you know he, the Blazers I mean get them out might as well right um, um well, he crashes, right you know, the facilities that we have. So it's like, just you know, just let him walk at this point. And uh, thoughts on Malasia and I guess Erickson coming to the club. Are, are you excited? I mean, Malasia is, from what I saw, very f- pretty technical and also really aggressive uh, fullback, likes to get forward. Shaw replacement. And no, he's a, he's a right back. Oh, he's on the right uh, side. So um, he likes to get forward. I'm pretty sure his numbers in terms of assists or chances created for um, Fayen or whatever, like, probably top five in the league, but I guess what are your thoughts on those signings? And then, yeah. I think, I think he'll be really good for us. I think, I don't know if he'll step in right away at the right back position. I think we'll give him some time. You know, I think the Turkish league is a little, he came from Turkey, right? If I'm not mistaken. No, he came from the Dutch league at Feyenoord. Oh, Dutch league. All right. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, the Dutch league is just nothing compared to the premier uh, compared to the Premier League, so I, I think he'll, we'll get some time, you know, play against some of the top players in practice. So I think he'll, he'll develop well. I think it's a good signing for us. Erickson, um, I'm excited to be honest with you. I mean, just seeing what he's come back from, like it's the craziest thing in my mind to, to go into cardiac arrest and then he's playing pro soccer again. Like it's the craziest thing. I'm like, how do you let this dude do this? And he's still, I mean, he's still a class. So I mean, I'm happy for that. And I mean, uh, I mean. Just to keep going back, I'm done with Rashford as well. I'm ready to get Rashford out? Oh, hey, wow. Give him one All more right. season. Well, Give him one. That's more the season. juicy stuff. Talk about his, talk about a scapegoat. Rashford, Marcus <laughs> Rashford is the ultimate scapegoat in United. It is one. Oh, I 100% agree. I mean, he yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, oh, I he's definitely it. a scapegoat at that point. He's he was young at the club, still young. You know, he had all these expectations to live up, but he's never lived up to them as much. I just, I mean, I just don't think we have so many good young. Uh, uh, so many young wingers. So I, I think we can do without him at this point, you know, sell him for the money. He did well for the community of Manchester. I mean, everything he does off the field is crazy. And then you hear like the rumors are like, oh, what are you doing off the field? Is that too much? Is that, is that taking his mind off soccer? It's like, oh, I like, give the guy some slack. But I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just done with him in yeah, my opinion. Right. So. My, no, yeah, my yeah, brother, yeah. my brother always says, uh, I can't wait for Marcus Rashford to run into defenders this season. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, those are all good points. I think uh, there's a lot of, I guess, mixed emotions with this United team from fans overall. So uh, I guess where do you see them finishing uh, this season, placement. and who would, who's a player that you think is going to have a a bright season ahead? Um, I think, oh, I mean, in my in my opinion, it's probably it's going to be Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea up there. And who else in for? Arsenal good too now. Oh, Jesus. Like, <laughs> Tristan Blake, was hoping for Tottenham. Tristan to Tottenham. What, what do you want me to say about Tottenham? I would like to say the <laughs> fourth where they finished this past season. I mean, I'm just saying. They had, had a good off season. I'm just Tristan, saying. Tristan, but, Tristan's on his Spurs high. Once they're like mid-year, he'll be back down to. Yeah. Tristan got the, <laughs> the, got the is, Champions League bad. The rule, the rule is, yeah, the rule is if at any point they're first, they've won the league. That's that's just how I go. <laughs> hey, I like that rule. I like <laughs> that rule. <laughs> and I guess something that just popped into my head. This is something we talk about quite a lot, and I think it's polarized many opinions to both ways. You're wearing one right now. What are your thoughts on keepers wearing hats during the game? You mentioned Dean Henderson. Oh. I don't. I don't well, know when. Let, I don't know when we'll have a, a keeper on the podcast let's, again. So let's let him finish. I guess where does United finish? Uh, we get to the hat. Yeah, 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 let's, yeah, yeah, And then we'll get to yeah, the hat yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Um, four or five is what I'm hoping. Okay. And I would love. I mean, I'm a I'm a Martial supporter. Through and through, it's kind of crazy <laughs> to say about. I hope he has a good year, even though he's probably not going to stay with the team. But I, I mean, I hope he has a good year. I think he's. I think he's very very talented, and you know, I don't think he's. I don't think he's really gotten his chance, to be honest with you, even though he's got a lot of chances. But I, I, I like him a lot, I think. I hope he does well this year. I hope he stays. Fair enough. Uh, now on to the hat question. Yeah, that is they, a- they keep the sun out of your eyes. I get that. You don't get to, you know, sometimes the sun's tougher on one side of the field, but you just to us, to it's it. a rather egregious decision. If you feel differently, please feel comfortable saying so, though. <laughs> um, Have you ever done take it? my hat off now at this point? <laughs> um, I just – I. 
I mean, I can't say I would ever wear a hat. I'd rather have the sun burn my eyeballs out of my head <laughs> at this point. I mean, it's just like a fashion thing, and I think you look goofy, to be honest. Swagging. But, I mean, it's so goofy. if the sun is that bad, then you got to do it, I think. But, you know, it's just uh, something I couldn't do for the look. What's a bigger wiener move? Is it wearing a hat or wearing sweatpants as a keeper? Like you saw the keepers with the shaggy bottoms back in the day. Like what is a more egregious fit for you? A hat with the, with the full on getup or like sweatpants? Like college sweatpants that say the name down the side of them. With the like, pads in them. Yeah, they say, you might as well say juicy on the ass, honestly. If you're going to wear sweatpants and gold, that's like to me what it, what it would look like. But what are your thoughts on a that? Well, Victoria's Secret, I like that. Yes. <laughs> Let me get my yogas in that. Yeah. I think I could rock them. You'd be caked um, up in the, between the poles. <laughs> exactly. Just modeling at that point, just laying yeah. down. They wouldn't even want to shoot at me. Um, who is that? The, the dude in the Euros who, who we played for, that goalie that wore the gray sweatpants and they were the baggiest things in the world, didn't look terrible. Um, this past the funny year, thing is, the funny thing is that my coach currently here hates people that, that wear sweatpants on the field. So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's got to be hats for me, though. It's definitely got to be hats. They just look way goofier. Yeah, Dino's hat was absolutely insane. It was like jet it black, and he was wearing a highlight that yellow kit. Sinful. I'm like, this, this could not be standing out it, more. It was definitely something that got a lot of eyes on him <laughs> with. So because he wasn't playing in sunglasses next, let's go red specs with the you know let's get some red specs glasses. The pit vipers, the band <laughs> all yeah. around the back, <laughs> oh. <laughs> get them nice and tight. You know, if you get hit in the face. Kind of, that thing's gonna pierce an eye. Yeah, yeah. Look yeah. Ollie, Ollie. But, it's, but it's about the look. It's about the Ollie was probably like, Dean, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ollie, I miss his smile. Um, <laughs> good vibes, FC. <laughs> good vibes, FC. No hats in those days, yeah. even though it was those days when Dino pulled it out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was an absolute pleasure having you, Blake. Thank you a million times for coming on and chatting with us and telling us about everything you've been experiencing and whether you like hats or sweatpants. I mean, it was really, uh, really a treat getting to, getting to talk to you tonight. Yeah. Best yeah. of luck with the upcoming season and your coaching. Thank you. I'm sure you'll continue to push the boundaries to success. So, yeah. So where, I guess anybody who listens and wants to keep up, where can they find you this season? Obviously you're at Scranton now, so you'll yep. be televised. You better dress sharp because you're going to get some eyes on you now that you're on, on that sideline. <laughs> yeah, so the University of Scranton, I'm on the women's side of soccer, D3 team, um, playing the Landmark Conference. So if you guys want to check us out, well, I think we're going to have a great year once again. So that's where I'll be. And then, you know, I, in the summers, I'm coaching an NPSL team right now. We have our playoffs game Friday. So tune in Friday night. Should be a good one. Let's go. Beautiful. I really love it. Blake, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us here at the Howlers Podcast. Be sure to check out all of our content on Twitter, TikTok, Twitch, YouTube. Check our link tree out. Check us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you want to listen to us. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye now.